got to drive like a bat out of hell to make it, right? So we're hurrying, grabbing stuff. Halfway to Salt Lake City, I realized I, did, I didn't grab my suitcase. So we call back to her mom, our, our room's upstairs, and to have her, please come to get it, bring it downstairs, get in her car, head to Salt Lake, we'll turn around, save lots of time. So that's the plan. I get a phone call. And then, now imagine my wife listening to this. Hello? Yeah? What? How big a hole? Where? In the wall? Are you serious? And Peggy's, what's going on? What's going on? Nothing. Your mom fell down the stores, stairs with a suitcase and she put a big hole in the wall with her head. So how big is the hole? <laughs> <laughs> my wife was so pissed off. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I am the sailor on this vessel. I am the able-bodied sailor on this vessel. I will take you on a ride, and you're going to love the ride today because today is a uh, a little glimpse, excerpts, if you will. That's a fun word to say, excerpts, uh, of the big discussion. And uh, I think this one's especially great. Now, I had to scrub it down, and I'm not going to use a lot of names and stuff because we... We recorded this to take notes, and uh, it, the clip is too good. We were I was uh, transcribing the notes from this, and uh, they were just too darn good to not share with you. So that's what's going to happen. The big discussion was really fun. If you didn't get a chance to go, uh, we're going to have another one. I'll have to tell you when it is. I, I don't even know if it's the date is set yet. In fact, I'm pretty certain it's not, which is par for the course for me to talk about it and not have a date. But, but I wanted you to hear kind of how it happened. And uh, what took place, and this is a really good little overview of kind of the 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 briefings that happened between topics. We would ha- take these big topics that the class determined. They picked the topics, which was great. And then they would talk about them. And then, in this case, uh, myself and Shane Bush would comment on them. And th- that usually led to further discussion which was a really great way to spend some time together, especially since when we did it in Denver, the day we did it was a gigantic snowstorm. So there was really no reason to leave the conference room. I mean, because the weather was crappy, even to go across the street to the House of Dank, which would have been entertaining, certainly. But the weather was even too bad to cross the street. It was bad. So we stayed around and ate cookies and lunch and did all the things you do and just talked to each other. And it was a really great way to get together with people who actually do the work we talk about for a living. And I think you'll appreciate it. It's a, it's a nice little glimpse into how the world happened. And and I think you'll enjoy it. There's plenty to learn here. That's for sure. Shane and I had a great time. The class was amazing. And that's because you guys are amazing. All of you are amazing. If you listen to this podcast, you clearly qualify as an amazing human being. Okay. That's already out out of the shoot. And uh, it was just a really nice time to get together. So fun was had by all. Other than that, um, you know, here we go. Right? We're, we're zooming in to make the world a better place, slowly but surely. And that is how life happens, I guess. Let's set the tone for this. Let's get into this. And here's what happened. We had a whole series of questions. And the question you're going to hear uh, in this elongated discussion is around the choice between using learning or using discipline as a management response to some kind of failure. So you've heard me talk about this a bunch. I mean, I think my, my information is probably out there in the world. This topic was dutifully taken on by a group of uh, seven or so people who do this work for a living. And you'll hear what they had to say to the rest of the big discussion on this topic specifically. Here it is. Discipline or learning? You choose. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. Okay, question 21 said, what criteria, if any, should be met before choosing disciplinary action against an employee? How should decisions about culpability be made? And from our experience, what other guidance do we offer on the topic? So we reframe that basically very simply. When is discipline appropriate? And uh, what do we lose when we do it? And what do we enable when we don't? 
So we, we all around the table had some examples to toss around. Um, and um, you'll get to hear some of those specifics in a second. But we discussed the black and white philosophy around you can either discipline or you can learn. And so I would argue, I may need PPE right now, <laughs> but I'm going to argue, uh, based on my recent experience, that uh, there are times, there are isolated cases when you have cowboy negligence where discipline is warranted and and needed in our organizations. It must happen, but I would say before discipline is issued, if we've got our leaders in the right place, there's a heck of a lot of learning that's gonna take place before they're ready to do it. So if our leaders are positioned well and educated well and we have an HP mindset in place, then before we go the discipline route, we're gonna to have to convince ourselves there's no other alternative. So that's exactly what's happened to us recently. So um, we, we're going to look at the system first, period. We're going to look at the system first. We're going to dig in. We're going to audit. We're going to learn. We're going to see if there was any – we're going to uproot the context, okay? And then when, if we do land in uh, and answer the questions, is it an isolated case? Were controls intentionally defeated? And is there a pattern here with this person? If the answer is no, then we don't discipline. We look at the system. If the answer is yes, then we're going to have to, for the good of the organization, issue that discipline. I think it's going to come out of this team is a lot of different opinions. <laughs> um, so we kind of start out with, I mean, if there's anything to learn, you can't then use discipline. Because once you do that, you're not going to learn. So OK. You got to decide what type of events you're interested in learning from. Um, people who smoke in the bathroom, I don't care, you can fire them. People who have sex in the parking lot, I don't care, you can fire them. But if something operational happens, there's something to learn there. Even if you think someone did something that's, that's horribly odd, um, a violation, <laughs> egregious violation. That said, there's one other maybe reason to use discipline. If you're in the middle of an interview, I'm sorry, uh, of an investigation or, or a learning team, and somebody you realize is lying, and I, and I say lie, it's not because that person's facts don't match what you think the facts are. Different perspectives, they aren't going to align. But if you have, for example, badge card access information and a video, and the person is clearly not telling the truth, we're done. Um, so that said, you know, the cowboy stuff, the crews that kind of uh, get caught doing something, uh, there's something to learn there, I think. Somehow we hired them. Somehow we let them work for 10 years, and all of a sudden now we're, we're unhappy with their performance. So, anyways. Seems like the other groups... Uh may have let the system influence them to a degree, but we were really free will, so I'm not sure this is going to be <laughs> connected to the question in any certain fashion. Wrong, uh, but let me just say this, and, and more so when we first started out, you know, over the last 10 years, there's probably been 15 really fantastic examples of when we initially heard a story and we had to ask ourselves, and sometimes leaders would ask us, is this something you really want to touch? This thing is so hot, so egregious, so obvious that it's not going to have a good outcome and it's going to besmirch the good name of, of learning. And let me tell you, those were the greatest learning opportunities we've ever had. And, and you know, only, only one of those 15 or 16 or 17 have we, have we ended up in discipline. The others, we, we learned so much about our organization, so much about our processes, so much to, to a degree that we set people up. And that has had such a huge change with those leaders who were involved to step out there and let the process have an opportunity. So let me start off with that. And then we were having a discussion, and then I kind of threw a turd. Can I say turd? Yeah, is yeah. it punchable? Yeah, yeah. So I threw a turd on the table. Uh, and it was to kind of get, kind of question, well, sounds like you discipline there. Is that kind of the right answer? Uh, and so we would have a bit of a dialogue, and we did. And the part, important part to me was is that it is a struggle. And we still discipline people, but let me tell you, 
it takes a whole lot longer and a whole lot more blood and a whole lot more sweat and tears out of the management team. We struggle with what to do. And I think that is the right answer. You know, whatever, we still discipline people. Uh, I personally consider that uh, a failure, right? So we've either failed to get the context or we failed on the front end by putting the wrong kind of person in the wrong kind of slot. There's, there, there's still a system component to even that kind of thing. <clears throat> Uh, I, like, I kind of like what, what Cliff had to say. He said, we, we allow discipline when there's nothing to learn. He, he talked about vices and such. Um, and then we were also given an example of cowboys, stone cold idiots on their own. Uh, if there's no other context, then okay, maybe we need to remove them before they hurt themselves or others. But we need to go to great lengths to ask, okay, in this case, the union couldn't believe that they were that stupid. Leadership team couldn't believe they would be that egregious. So how is it that we have two people, not just one insane person, but two people who work together who, in their context, thought those were acceptable actions, those things would work? That's a really great question for us to ask the broader group. How do, how do we get people like that? I mean, if we, have, if, we, if we feel that we're compelled to discipline them, we still need to stand back and ask that, that question. Um, and whatever process you guys use, you know, we are super engineer oriented and years ago when we started the process, uh, we, we had the culpability matrix, right? So whatever process in your mind you get to, to say, oh, I understand this is a shared responsibility. It's not digital. It's analog, but it looks like we're justified to do something with this guy this time. Well, even though we're justified to do something this time with this person, is that the best long-term answer for the organization? What are we willing to give up from a learning aspect to show that we were serious this time? And is that the best long-term course um, for the organization? And what, one time I was in a uh, conversation with a C-level kind of guy, and he said people could have been killed, and we got to show that we're serious. Um, and discipline is the, is the motivation that we'll provide to people to change their actions. And I, I came back and I said, hey, boy, this is egregious. Uh, people can be killed. This is so serious that we absolutely must absolutely learn exactly why they thought it made sense to do what they did so it doesn't happen again. And that's the two. Everybody wants to do a good job. And that's one of the principles. People come to work to do a good job. Leaders who have that historic safety one mindset want to do a good job. And we just long term have to continue to work with them that as far left, let me say left, if we, when we talk about the scale of predestination and free will, that we'll probably never get there, but that's where we need to continue to try to look because that's where the struggle in the process is. And I'm not so good with time, so I'm probably over my allotted time here, uh, so I'll quit. But I do want to ask uh, still figure out where left is. The, uh, that we add a question number 32, root cause, comma, is jihad the answer? So <laughs> I just want to do that. Uh, yes, I think it is. <laughs> so now we're the last three of us are between you guys and lunch. Um, <laughs> we'll be cautious here. I, I think this is uh, that, like the real estate that's left to cover on this topic is not going to be done justice in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. But um, that's a, a big step forward to sit in that group and actually talk about. And when we talk about accountability, uh, I like your comment on this, accountability up and forward versus accountability back and down. Um, this leader is thinking about that and thinking about what what is the message, what is the signal, uh, what is being sent by the reaction that's taken. And, and I, there's a lot of territory here. I think the context is everything. Um, and, uh, you know, from a leadership perspective, that accountability up and forward is, I guess, from my perspective, you, you can do that, but you're also looking in a rear view mirror. Your decisions, your actions, that reflects back on that crew, those decisions. And so that leadership reflection from an investigation perspective, the follow up, the learning, et cetera, um, I think that needs to be territory that is combed uh, with a fine tooth comb uh, because the system is perfectly designed to get the results we get. And so uh, when we get into these really egregious violations where you're dealing with willful, willful 
culpable negligence, borderline criminal, you know, what is it? What's incumbent on leadership to actually, what sort of action do we take to send those signals? So it's a journey. I definitely don't have the answers on this, but I think the culpability model is something that our organization ha had adopted outside. Uh, you know, our organization is a, you know, conventional, traditional setting, not from the nuclear side. We use that to put some calibration into the system to help leaders actually make good choices along the way and have sort of refined that process over time. And it has made a difference. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of stemmed the tide on the ready, fire, aim scenario to a little more calibration on let's try and get this right the first time. So, and I would add same thing we others said. It's a really smart team. I think everyone must have moved from this table to that one. Uh, you said you were the only one left. So. Like, like lemmings to a problem. Yeah. Um, I, I would add on the culpability tree, uh, we patterned. I've seen Alcoa is the one that I've initially used, and Dave Payne and Chevron shared with me Chevron's. And it is a really good tool to get where Cliff was. Don't get ahead of the game. Even if you think, because our organizations are convergent thinking people, we can solve any problem, just put it in front of us. And we lack the experience of divergent thinking. So we've spent a lot of time training people that think more divergently to go slow, to go fast. It's like giving a tool that people need to learn how to use. It's different from what they're... So that divergent thinking is something that's really helped us. The second part of that is part of our leadership training, we've trained over 10,000 frontline leaders and leaders, is think, how do you ask darn good questions? Because if you don't ask the right, you'll get a yes or no, or you'll get the question you're looking for if you don't ask a darn good question. So those two things, along with the culpability tree, has helped our leaders become more effective in going slow to go fast, like Cliff said. All right, nothing like being the last guy before lunch, right? I love it. Pressure. You're, you're perfect for it. Yeah. Well, Todd talks about perspective uh, sometimes, and, and everybody in here uh, at one time or another has looked at something from their own personal perspective. Me, I'm always looking up, okay? Uh, I've been on the receiving end of discipline before. Most of the people in this room have issued discipline before. I feel like that leadership has a responsibility to look at each individual case and decide, is that punishment or is that discipline, is that what's best for the organization? Is that what's best for that individual? Or is learning the bigger value here? What, which one's more valuable? Which one does or reaches the goal that we're after? Um, I think that every situation, again, is different, and I think you have to take the time to, to get the facts and look at, and weigh every, everything out. Um, Tony Bashara, you said he said uh, something. Is, is it a sin? Well, I would just say for him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. And I guess I'll leave it at that. No, I think that's a good place to leave it. Do you want to go first? Yes. And, and I'm going to just real quick. If you don't, your head's going to explode. I, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, don't, I, I don't expect any comments. In fact, I'd ask you not uh, to comment until after lunch because I'm just going to throw out two things for you to think of during lunch and then we'll get into it afterwards. So one of the criteria, whenever I'm faced with this decision, what do we do? I, the first question I think we should decide is, was the incident or the error or whatever they did related to meeting the mission of the organization? I think you need to decide that right off the bat. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, we had an employee at the Idaho National Lab. Now, we're 890 square miles, so we're big. Had an employee at the Idaho National Lab, brought a 68 Camaro, blown 350 in a four-speed Muncie. Decided to show his buddy at lunch what he'd built. So at lunch, he took off, and uh, when he ran the stop sign, he was doing about 140 or 120. Now, he didn't mean to run the stop sign. It was an error. So what would you do with that employee, and it, did it have anything to do with meeting the mission of the organization? 
Don't answer that, just think about it. I'm going to answer the question after lunch. We had another employee driving a water truck out to a job site, ran a stop sign, had an accident. Would you all agree it was the same error? You ran a stop sign. But what is so significantly different? <clears throat> so we will address, I will address that after lunch, because I got a lot to say about that. And, and I would just say one thing before lunch, just to kind of cap it off. I've spent a lot of my life in this discussion with lots of people who wear suits. And here's what I'll tell you. The organizations that push hardest for discipline, I almost always find have the worst performance management systems. And what they've done over time is use safety to manage bad performance, mm -hmm. yep. right? And so the first question I'd ask you in your organization is if discipline is a struggle, do you have a robust performance management? Do, do leaders have hard conversations with workers around performance issues? And I almost can guarantee you the answer is going to be, if your organization is struggling with discipline, is that your performance management system sucks. The, the last thing I'll say, and I think it was, you said it better than I could say it. Normally you're over there, but now you're over there. Is to me, the test is, is what does the organization need from this event? And, and that test is so rich. And it goes right back to something Kurt coined, or IP coined, but I first heard from Kurt. That's deliberate improvement. That, and if the organization, what, what do we need from, what do we want from this? Do we want to get better or do we want to get even? So, and, and I promise you, if, if they're smoking in the bathroom, I, I'm with Cliff. I don't know, it seems like an easy rule. Don't do it. See you later. Work someplace else, right? So that's how question one worked. Uh, pretty nice, huh? I, I, th I thought you'd like it. Um, it's a really great way to build upon and chunk information and move it carefully. Let's listen to another one. And this time, let's listen to the topic on the delineation between human performance, HOP, they call it, and safety differently. Where do they align? Where don't they align? Complete different group. Still talking about learning. Still talking about moving on. Listen carefully to this topic as well. Y'all ready? <laughs> Interface between hop and safety two, right? Or whatever, yep. however you form the question. We actually didn't change the question. Oh, nice. Uh, but what we did do is we had to define what safety two is. So, Dave, you want to help us define what safety two is? Good luck. We've got a diagram. i got to set up for this. Wow. <laughs> so... We think back to what we've seen the whole Nagel diagram where you have the basic bell curve, right? And on one small corner is everything colored in red. That'd be hard for me to see. And that's where all the events happen. That's safety one, uh, safety one, and that's all anybody ever looks at. And then you say, well, let's look at what goes right. So I'm look at the rest of the bell curve. And that's where you look at those things that back to barriers that are put in place. Those things that never get talked about when the work is done, right? So you think about how does work get done? Work is imagined. And then you got work as planned as that blue line goes all crazy, right? And no one ever talks about that blue line unless something fails. Now all of a sudden you're going back to that little right-hand corner on the bell-shaped curve. So what we're trying to do is say use human organizational performance, how the organization helps set you up to, one, be successful. So when you're on that blue line, you don't get too low and change because... Time's been compressed. You are over budget and behind schedule. It's a metric job that's got to get done before the end of the year. And you start pushing, pushing time pressure on folks to the point where now a, make it simple for me, a two-hour job, you've only allowed an hour and a half. So now you're forcing people into the situation where they're more likely to slide into that red zone, right? So now you think of that on the black line, workers imagine, blue line, Variable work. Now that starts to drift down and it comes in contact with the worst line, the red dash line, which is the hazard line. And we call all these folks in and what do we look at? How much difference between the black line and the blue line? Well, you didn't follow procedure. You didn't do this. Well, you gave me the job late. We're behind schedule. Well, let's talk about how you just didn't get the work done. Then we say, okay, let's look at the blue line to the red line. Because when does the accident occur? 
It's not when the black line, blue line don't match up. It's when the blue line and the red heather line match up. We got to figure out what they're actually doing, what barriers now were not there that had that blue line and red dash line meet. So the idea of hop organizational performance, looking at how the organization helps set the people up for success, you got to go look and see when success happens so you can ensure those barriers stay in place or if they start to fail, start to get weakened, that you can throw them back up. Yeah, perfect. All yours. <laughs> so part of it, uh, we were talking a little bit ago, is, is it's, you know, HOP is probably the overarching uh, program or process that you have, and, and that the safety two or safety differently would almost be your metric, if you will, of, of what normal looks like and then the gap between uh, the hazard and, and what normal looks like and fixing that gap or maintaining uh, the, the above the black line, pulling the correct levers uh, in order to be successful or see what success looks like on a normal day. Success and failure probably look very the, very closely to the same uh, for the most part. Yeah. They look a lot alike until they're not yeah. at the very end, sure. until the outcome is not what somebody didn't want to have happen. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so to kind of um, kind of finish up, the, the things that uh, we also discuss and things that I got out of it is you know, with the safety two approach, so how do we merge that? We want to leverage of it and show that it, it, it allowed us to get to this next step. So we don't want to break down everything that we've already done. We want to build upon that. Um, otherwise, we kind of lose credibility with all of our safety efforts. You know, we, we keep saying, well, what we've done is wrong. We're going to try something new. What we've done is wrong. We're going to try something new instead of going, hey, we've, we, what we did was good. It got us to this point. Now we've learned some more things, and we're going to leverage a the things that we've learned, and we're going to take it to the next level. So with safety two, identifying those gaps or deltas, if you will, between the blue line and black line, positive and negative. A, you know, a delta doesn't have to necessarily we associate delta often with negative connotations, but it can also be a positive delta where the workers, based upon their experience and, and circumstances, are doing things safer. They adapt and they actually do things better than what the procedures or, if you will, the black line had anticipated. So when we see that, we want to learn from that equally as well so we can then take the things that they've learned, the things that they do, and apply them systematically as we move forward. And equally important for the, the negative deltas, if you will, for when real work is not performed to the same level or doesn't provide the same level of control from the hazards that we've anticipated, we, we learn from that, understand the context, and find out what happened. So with safety two, probably looking more at the individual now with kind of with a hop, looking at the organization, the systems that we have in place. So how can we improve the systems so that this, the individual can be more successful? And that's what we have. Comments or questions? What do you think? So I would say something to really affirm what Dave said. One of the most important uses of that asymptotic curve when you talk to your organization is the fact that you can show this dramatic progress from the safety one effort. And I think building a bridge from old to new while reinforcing what we've done as a foundation upon which we can build this new thinking becomes a really, really important tool socially and psychologically. Because what you're saying is everything that we've done in the past is not wrong. It's that if we continue to do the same thing, our system is saturated. And it's saturated with the uh, the traditional approach to managing safety, safety one stuff. That what we have to do is keep the safety one as a part of it, but actually drive towards the, the new approach, this, the safety two part. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, and I actually have already made comments on this, so I'll keep it short. But like I said, when, when anybody comes to me and says, oh, is this a new flavor of the month and all that, same thing Todd said, just, just make sure they realize uh, this is all part of a journey, and at the time, that was appropriate, and let's not lose that. Let's add to that. For example, BPP. How many of you are BPP sites? Only a couple of people. Uh, management, leadership, employee involvement, right? We pound that drum, pound that drum, pound that drum. Well, if you've already got that foundation, you're going to have a lot easier transitioning to this than if you didn't have that foundation. So that's how I would explain it to people is uh, take the nuggets, just like you said. Take the nuggets of what you've already done and then build them. And that, my friends, was your excerpt from the big discussion. Two full answers, all before lunch. A lot of lunch pressure. You can't stop the pressure of lunch. I hope you enjoyed it. It was really fun. Thanks for being a part of it if you were there. If, if you weren't there and you want to be a part of one, 
come to one. They're really fun. Um, it's nice. I like the agenda freedom, uh, the fact that we don't have to hit to slide 68 at the end of the day. We can talk about stuff as long as we want to talk about stuff. Free will, predeterminism, learning versus punishment, hop, safety too. All those topics were important. That's our podcast for today. Thanks for listening. Tell your friends. And I'm so glad you're a part of it. Until then, learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>